call the Board of Commissioners staff meeting to order um, February 4th, 2016, in the Jackson First item on the agenda is discussion of the Oregon Watershed Enhancement Board Land Acquisition Grant Program. And this was something um, I, Colleen Roberts, <laughs> had requested or it was interested if one of the other commissioners wanted to readdress because we had discussed it at a prior meeting. That being, um, if I recall the conversation, it was a, public, a private land sale. We did, we're going to take a position. And I went to the hearing on the 21st uh, to summon it. And um, from that, I just wanted to know if we wanted to discuss taking a position in some of my concerns in follow-up to this. Did you get a copy of that fair handout in the packet? Okay, so my... Not in the packet, but I have a copy of it. Okay. So um, we did copy their, their handout for each of you and get it if you don't have it. This is the 352 acres that um, the OVEB grant is helping to get the conservation easement to. And first of all, I guess I have three, three points I want to discuss. One, that it's state money to purchase private land or in a conservation easement and that um, is concerning to me in, in where that's headed. Secondly, because we've seen when we talked with um, Greg Walden's office about the wilderness area and how they have patches and they want to put them together and where this is going um, possibly in light of the, the, um, the road, the uh, wild and scenic they're trying to do um, is my second point and the, the goals 2020 with, with water and is, a, is another concern I have. But reading from their own book, their long-range concerns, which is like inside the, the thing, I just want to read it. It says, it kind of just depicts their goal. It says, fortunately, this land is not, talking about the, the 352 acres, is not isolated nor disconnected from us all, and its influence doesn't stop at its property lines. It's a vital part of a much larger ecosystem, together with local properties that are already con served by Jackson County, the state, the federal government, and the Nature Conservancy, as well as other private lands with high conservation values. The Rogue River Preserve can become part of one of the largest land conservation efforts in Oregon. We could one day see a connected set of protected lands covering more than 5,000 acres and nearly 15 miles of the Rogue River. That alone concerns me. And I, I will, like I just said, I will make my own objection to this. The public comment time is till April, um, mid-April sometime, and I just don't know if we want, if you want to discuss it as well, Commissioner, on if we want to make a board stand. So what are you proposing? Do you have a suggested language, or what do you think? No, I don't. Just an objection to the OLAB ac land acquisition grant program. That's what the public hearing was about, and that is the... Right, I guess what I'm, what I'm, I'm trying to zero in on, are you, and I think you just hit it, is are you looking at objecting to the OWEB program that's going to be used, so the dollars used on these private acquisitions, or this particular acquisition itself? Um, well, I think this public comment time will be about this OWEB grant, particularly. And I think this we need to grant? Mm -hmm. okay. this, I, I would this, this land acquisition grant. Okay. I would, I would ask that we would take a, if we're going to look at, not necessarily the specific, but the root of the problem, which would be, or the root of it, as you just described it, would be using OVA forms, water enhancement. So if those were watching Oregon Water Enhancement Board funds to, um, to do watershed OLED, it's watershed enhancement board. Yeah. Um, using those funds to acquire conservation because there's already national LWCF funds, matter water conservation funds that are available for this type of stuff because this basically starts a secondary program within the state of Oregon for this type of pro this type of piece. So I, that that's where I, my mind would go is do we want to hit it just on this piece or are we going to look at the overarching concept of having a secondary program for the to be able to have public funds available to acquire private land. So can I just offer a few sure. points that I think might be important. Um, OWEB is federal pass-through dollars to the state. So they're not two different programs, they're the same program. Federal agencies use federal OWEB dollars, state agencies, or 
member citizens groups of our state access OF funds through the state and parks program. OF funds actually get managed both at the state level through state parks and at the federal level through federal parks. When there's an acquisition, both of those at the state level, both of those levels of government have to agree. Um, I would just point out that much of the county park inventory was purchased with OWEB funds, much of it from private parties, putting it in government control, much of the land along the Bear Creek Greenway that the county didn't own or wasn't not otherwise governmentally owned land, which was acquired, was acquired by the use of OWEB funds through uh, Oregon Parks um, for the purposes of developing the Greenway. Once again, moving it from private to government ownership in, the, in that case. So the county has been a huge user of these funds in order to serve our citizens in our parks system specifically. We also have used them to purchase from private sellers, which does essentially set it in conservation because the rules with the funds require very specific uses, whether you're a nonprofit, Southern Oregon Land Conservancy, or your Jackson County government, or the city of Medford is also a large user. Uh, we did also use this funds to acquire the property where we're building an RV park from a private entity. It was uh, uh, the concrete company, LTM, that we purchased those properties from. So, so if you were going to take a position generally just opposed to this program, I do want you to know there will be a huge impact on the county's ability to develop our parks, our park system, the Greenway, other projects that you all have approved that we would move forward with. My suggestion is if you want to look on a case-by-case -case basis, that's, that would probably be a, a better approach. Um, otherwise, uh, we're really limiting what the county is able to do for some of the projects you've already approved and agreed to. Well, perhaps the, the agenda was titled differently than I requested. I requested a discussion of this um, public comment time about oh. this acquisition. Oh. Because we had decided not to make a, a stand or a, as a board uh, on this acquisition. And, and I asked, can we revisit it? And we agreed we would talk about it. So I'm talking about this acquisition. Well, I, this, I read the title and I'm going to try to. Yeah, this said grant program. And I just wanted to speak to this acquisition, which the, the public hearing was for. And I might say the public hearing was poorly um, advertised for citizens to find out about it. I heard from several people that. It was a had difficult time finding um, information about this public hearing, but there was attended. Well, you know, the room was packed, mm -hmm. and I, I like I say, I will make my own. If if the board doesn't want to make a position, I'll make my own um, in personally um, a, a opposition to it. But if our board, I am a, a opposed to it. It's just right the right acquisition. Bridge, right? It's adjacent to the <clears throat> property. That's why the county was even approached. The county's actually approached to support the project. Yes. And I told our staff that we wouldn't do that without the board's approval. And we actually had the discussion to recommend that this remain neutral on it. It is a benefit to our park, obviously, yeah, for that particular that. area. And here's a map. Um, there's Agate Road. On Highway 234. So I, I think our park is. Yeah, our park was actually right. Mm -hmm. so, now, what's the landowner? I mean, this is the landowner that wants to do something with their land. Do you have any idea what the landowner wants to do? I don't, I don't know what the landowner wants to do. I do. Did. We explained this to you when we came and brought the issue to you. So, the landowner are the heirs of a property owner who bought the property. Essentially, it's a private property to maintain and conservation. The heirs want to continue to maintain it as their parents, as specifically their father had hoped to have it maintained in conservation. So they approached the Southern Oregon Land Conservancy about selling it to them to, in order to maintain it in conservation. So I understand Commissioner Roberts' concern about the statements that he made in the literature on the contiguous land acquisition concepts. That we're, we're fighting on the back side of right. other issues, and right. this would get an opportunity to fight on the front, well, on the front side, but before it's done. I understand what you're saying. I'm torn between private property rights and the rights of a, a landowner to do what they want with their own land, 
they could do what they want. I'm objecting to, oh well, does Oregon Water Shed Enhancement Board money going towards it? That's, that is what the pub, public comment is for, is for that part, and that part only. So, and that, like say, if we have till April, okay. if we want to bring it back to another board discussion with Mr. Dyer, if he's here, um, at a future meeting. Well, I just, um, you know, in this literature, it has a piece here. If we can succeed in placing this land in the hands of those who will preserve its elite ecology and natural beauty, then we will have fulfilled our family's mission as stewards of this special place. And it's written by Maria MacArthur, granddaughter of Robert Newell, who uh, was the owner of the property. So um, as I read the literature, it is, I hear that the family wants this to become some kind of park where people can access it and people and the public has the ability to come visit it. So let me back up. Yeah. Putting it in the control of Southern Oregon Land Conservancy doesn't provide necessarily that the public can access it. They would have control over whether or not that occurred. <coughs> there also has been statements made about you know, moving this into nonprofit ownership means we lose the tax base. Right. Southern Oregon Land Conservancy by way of choice, chooses to continue to pay taxes even though they're not required to pay taxes on property. Yeah. They do that in our county with all property that they have acquired, so it doesn't affect the property tax base that way. It's taxed just as if it were a private uh, property. They're not required to do that, so they can <coughs> discontinue that practice at any time, so but I just want you to know that that, that is the case. Um, but it would be just like any private property owner would have control over the property. I mean, if they sold it to someone who wasn't the Southern Oregon Land Conservancy, a private property owner doesn't have to let people on the property either. So. Yeah, I mean, I'm not objecting to the, the rights of the private property owners sell to whoever they want. I, I'm objecting to uh, the, the grant from the state. You're, you're objecting to the use of state funds to the Southern Oregon Land Conservancy for the for purpose this, of the For purchase. this purpose. If they want, yeah, I'm assuming if they want to raise funds some other way that doesn't Include a government subsidy. You're not trying to limit their right no. to do what they want. This won't limit that right at all. Yeah, I'm, I'm just trying to clarify. That I'm, I'm just trying to help you articulate. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. I just wanted to clarify exactly what you're looking for. Here, the, the grant program that you talked about. So, yeah, I'm, I'm not opposed to not using uh, public funds for for these types of. I, I see one of the things that I, I don't think you were on the commission at the time. One of the things that we were dealing with this uh, in the last few years was the Table Rocks expansion, and the BLM was basically is in the process of purchasing land from the Nature Conservancy to be able to place that into federal ownership, mm -hmm. and LWCF funds were used for the original purchase of that land during the Nature Conservancy. In this process, and the think. Nature Conservancy is profit from the private sector, and then they turn around and sell it for profit, uh, in profit, back to the federal government, to the government, and then turns it into a place. And what I noticed in that process, and we discussed in the previous one, if I, not, if I remember correctly, uh, the restrictions that the BLM placed on that land was actually more restrictive than any other public land in our county. And it was based on the fact that that was the sale, the contingency of the sale, because that's what the Nature con uh, Conservancy wanted, is they wanted to put more restrictions on the use of that land. And, and it was really disturbing, because if it, if it goes into public ownership, it's supposed to be a public access, and this is what people do to it. But to have it more restrictive than anything else you need, was just to me just what the heck's going on here? Well, and they were making an area of environmental right, concern, going on. a whole area. Because that was some of the first restrictions there that weren't weren't necessarily the case anywhere else. I remember John Ramey being here talking about it. So, what you're you're you're, you're close. What what occurred was the previous board supported the acquisition of the property by the Nature Conservancy and access to land and water conservation yeah. funds to do so with the understanding that that property would be transferred in ownership to BLM, that it would be managed the same, with the same rules and regulations as the Table Rocks were currently being managed, because this is land that 
was part of the table rocks essentially that had been held in pre same private ownership. What occurred was once they acquired the property, then they were required to do a land use management plan. So they did apply the equal rules that existed previously uh, in the interim of developing a uh, long term management plan. There were proposals in the long term management plan that would have created more than. And they came and explained that to the board, and the board objected to those additional, you know, restrictions. Um, to be honest with you, I don't even think they're done with mm -hmm. the planning for the Table Rock, so I don't think that there's been an outcome that we can say that's what happened yet. Um, but the board is on the record as taking a position of not increasing restrictions. They agreed to the project with the understanding that there would be the same equal access for the public that there was with regard to every other part of the Table Rock. And, you know, so that was the dis dispute after it happened. And like I said, the Nature Conservancy or BLM, um, they can change their mind. So what I'm telling you today, you know, they, they could, nature, or the, in this case, the Army Land Conservancy could decide they're gonna completely prohibit public access, even though that's not what they're saying they're going to do, they could. And they could decide not to pay taxes and the BLM, you know, they have to do is go through a land use planning process, uh, long term land use planning process, and they can create new restrictions or remove some restrictions. Typically, we you know they don't remove restrictions, <laughs> but they could. So, so about this public I, I agree with comment you opposing the use of public funds for the acquisition. If they really want to be as conservative place and take it over by the or as they say here, they can donate. Mm -hmm. If they really want that, they can donate it to the, uh, the state. Right. But what I see here is public funds being used to purchase the property. Maybe they try, I don't know if they try to sell it or something, I couldn't tell you. But um, if they want to sell it, they can sell it. If they want to donate it to the program, I know we've had people donate to the county their properties for a different process. I was a, we had a ranch here not too long ago. Donated to us, they were required somehow. How can you give us the background on that? Who before me? Given the, the grant? Givens, that, yeah, that was a long time ago. And, you know, we were, we were looking to have other property donated to us um, and in the process. Well, actually, it was a partial, partial purchase with a tax write off for the balance of the appraised value. This was when uh, Galton. Property. He went through bankruptcy essentially, and in the bankruptcy, the trustee sold the property to Jim Bushi or Mona so Bushi. Right, so it was going to give us access to our park. So we te technically it never got donated to us. You know, we were in the process of negotiating a partial purchase with a donation, and it was a land and water conservation fund conversion. So the difference in value was something we would have to come up with cash if they didn't agree to provide us, uh, you know, to donate it and take the tax deduction. So there's, a, once again, another land and water conservation fund acquired property <coughs> that the county. And I think looking at those individually is really important. And it gives us the opportunity to weigh in at their, their comment time. And that's all I'm asking. Do we want to weigh in? And I think council could prepare something or have to prepare something to weigh in on just basically said we have concern about too much land going into federal ownership right now or into government ownership well do you do you want to do that or do you want to say that you oppose this particular use of funds for this particular acquisition because i'm telling you we are applying for land and water conservation funds to expand the road river greenway to the bear creek greenway by acquiring private property which is something the board's directed and approved us to do. So to say you're against it while at the same time we're acquiring it as a government agency doesn't, you know, that's kind hey, of contradictory. I'd like to say oppose it for use for this project, for this acquisition. That's what uh, the comment, the comment time period is very specific to this acquisition. It gives us the opportunity to weigh in on this one. And, and it sounds like I'll be drafting a letter. Would you please? Um, are there concerns? Because as I understand it, the, cons the, the how, <coughs> how it currently is, is being proposed is that it's not going to go into government ownership. It's going to go into the, the ownership. The Southern Oregon Land Conservancy right. is going to get a grant 
So is the concern that this board has? Government funds being used to buy property and maintain the private ownership. So government funds being used to purchase property, private, private property, property. Buy, buy a private property. Yeah. And New this particular yeah. acquisition. They're, they're not, this, the ownership's not transferring over to the government for a park or something like right. that. It's maintaining in the nonprofit that the funds are being used to acquire. The, just so you all know, I mean, if you actually look at the legislation, the federal, and then the state, what the state does is adopt rules to be able to accept essentially be a fiduciary agent for past your dollars. This is the purpose of the fund. I mean, it's why the fund exists, is to acquire properties. And there are specific rules about what you can do with those properties once you acquire them. All of our land and water conservation fund acquired properties, you know, uh, require us to use them for public outdoor use, basically. Right. Um, and there's a whole list of details of what that means and doesn't mean. Um, uh, so, and the rules are the same um, for them. But it doesn't mean you can't limit access. What you can't do is you can't give um, uh, you can limit access, but you can't. Uh, what do we do with Cascade Christian? That we see that we're really working on. Uh, well, they were given exclusive access. Yeah, you can't give exclusive access, so you can't say it. Now, only these people can access the property. But you can limit access to the property. You just can't give exclusive use. So, you know. Well, I'm adamantly, adamantly against this one because I, I think there's, you know, we use the term unintended consequences, so we'll be fighting down the road. And I see, see those as very possible. Like I said, if, if the LWCF funds or OM funds being used to acquire property that's going into government ownership and it's going to be public use, I still believe that there needs to be some kind of recent change in legislation that there has to be a, a land swap concept. So if they're going to put more into the federal percentage, there needs to be a certain that equal amount coming back out. So that that's, that that is a rule, but not until you convert the property. Right. So if they bought the property with land water conservation funds and decided they wanted to sell it to private ownership again, what they have to do is go out and find another piece of property that they can take the funds from the acquisition of the private ownership of great equal or greater value and purchase another property. So it, it works like you say, but in the reverse. Right. It doesn't work. First you have to exchange a private piece of property for a for a yeah. and a large conservation fund obtained property. It's once you obtain a property, if you want to do something else with it, you have to it's called a conversion, you have to convert it. So it it, it what you're saying does exist, maybe just not in the order that you want it to be in. But doesn't well if they want to sell that property, they buy, they acquire they sell that property back into public and then acquire new government property. Mm -hmm. right. And that's not what I was saying. What I was saying, what I'd like to see is <clears throat> if they intend to buy government or buy property out of the private sector, they need to release an equal amount back into the public sector. So if you're going to convert it to government property, you have to convert X amount back it, it, into it's, public. It's circular, but what I'm saying is it's the chicken or the egg. Yeah. That's what, saying, what you're saying happens. It needs to be done up front. Well, it, it, it's a lot of critical mass. Do, do you have any concerns about just any other one or so? Of course, we have some general concerns about government funds being used to help a private property owner acquire private property. Um, is there any concern specifically about this particular track of land? Um, I, I don't. I'm not familiar with the area, so I, I, I'm just trying to figure out all, all of the I board's think, concerns. I think I've got it. We, we can work on it together. It just comes down to the fact that. They're opposed philosophically right. to government funds going to make a private purchase. Yeah. And, and I am concerned about this particular plot of land as depicted in their brochure that it's it's linked to everything that we're looking at and objecting to the wild and scenic with the BLM, the Table Rock Monument proposal, and they're saying it's linking it outside their borders. And I, I, it just screams mayday to me. <laughs> you know, and I wouldn't mind that being in there based on the literature. I mean, they basically said it, it's the intent to have a contiguous piece. And this would be the, uh, basically a, a patchwork way of creating that contiguous corridor along the Rogue River where people no longer have the ability to 
uh, live on the Rogue River that we've been doing for all these years. Just, just so you understand, it's not this that would facilitate that. If it's designated wild and scenic, it, it doesn't matter if it's in private ownership or rental. It could stay a private property if it's made wild and scenic, it will still apply. So there isn't a link between making it a wild and scenic and whether or not the we, I mean, land of yeah. water or yeah. maybe yeah. Right. Southern Oregon Land Conservancy well, as it, or it's owned in private ownership. The same rules apply. Yeah, but it's the beginning of a link of being able to put government owned all the property up and down that people no longer live on the river. And that's what I see in this particular place. If it becomes a conservancy issue, people no longer get to enjoy living on the river as they had in the past. And if they, if I read this correctly, they, what Commissioner Roberts is depicting is that it, it's their intent to start acquiring land up and down the river that would facilitate this putting it into conservancy that's contiguous. And that may be true. Yeah, but what I'm saying what is, to. it's not limited by whether or not there's a wild or scenic designation. No, I understand. If they were all private home, the same rules would apply. And but the difference is, is under the, what I'm seeing done here, people would no longer be allowed to live on the river if their goals you know, yeah, are identified not, here. It would I, take I, a way of life away from the Rogue Valley. I'm not disagreeing with that. With that yeah. which I'm just saying that I want to make sure we're not linking and that's what right. the concern is. And with this particular grant, I don't know that we've seen anything that guarantees it's you know being held in perpetuity for for the citizens either. Okay. We agree. Is that what you're looking for? <laughs> yeah. I, how about you? We'll get a draft that? and bring it back to the board. And maybe if you all want to wait till all three of you are here, okay. Then you can, or or not. I mean, it only takes two of you to draft. We can do it right now. Well, well, we put together a draft team and bring it back to make sure that we capture the points. And then it, that sounds like the concrete and the material, but it's open until April. So right. we'll have an opportunity for the board to review the draft and, and make any, if, you, if there's more issues that come up, um, better to put them all into one letter than to um, send a letter and not and address just, everything. Just because you're not here. Not here. Not here. Not here. Yeah. That would be great. Okay. So moving on to the second item on our agenda is the discussion of increased audio accommodations, also something um, I have requested um, to be put on the agenda. And that is something we've discussed in the past about having these Tuesday, Thursday meetings, the audio file being put on the web page. And um, I've gotten two different, uh, a re an updated quote from our administrator about the cost. Do, and do you have that? Um, and I had the, the previous quote. Uh, you guys put it in my packet, so I assume you put it in there. Okay. So um, this is something I have wanted for a year. <laughs> and I wanted as a citizen as well to have access to audio files like the people can access the televised files on our web page. Um, so there's two different items to think about if that's the philosophy that we want as a board and the cost. It, um, so if it is, uh, I kind of looked at it with a SWOT analysis for, um, in looking at this, the strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats to making a new change to what we do. So my strength I see is the transparency that, that um, I want and I think I would think our board wants how we arrive at decisions, the discussions we have. The public can know the meat of the discussions firsthand. They can tune into it um, without relying on media or without relying on third-party narrative that may or may not be misleading. It would be from the county to the people. And that is also the opportunity, is that we have that leadership role in getting our information out to anybody who wants to access it. The strength I have see is that there's other people that, besides myself, that have, have expressed this interest. Uh, League of Women Voters has shown their support, um, and uh, it is their duty in the support of government transparency in there. And what they do for meetings, it's been requested by citizens as well. Um, also, I think it's an opportunity in my opinion, not ever having installed a new program into government, but we could do it on a trial basis, six months, a year, reassess it, see if it is access, see if it has been helpful, see if the cost is what it's being projected, 
and reevaluated it at a agreed period of time. The only weaknesses I see in this is it's been stated that um, it might inhibit our discussions, and it shouldn't. Um, I think we should be able to talk about anything, uh, whether we're being videotaped, audio taped, um, and whether it's being produced or not. And the cost is, is definitely uh, uh, something we will have to consider if we want to put out. And the only threat, I don't see threats, I just think it's a greater transparency in government. And so that's my end of the discussion on it. What is yours? It's a lot of money. So we're looking at a uh, total cost for the first year of 10 grand. There's a license on top of that and the support staff on top of that, or is that first year of 10,000? That's total. Total. Okay. The second year, <coughs> And then it reduces from 10 to about 8,000 year, every year after that? Well, it's actually, and then it, it, it reduces, reduces in year two because the licenses last for a certain amount of time, but the cost plus overhead go up because the right. cost of staff and overhead goes up every year. So while it drops a little bit in year two, over time it would go up. Um, just a couple of points to make. So in, in the first year, if you look at the cost of $10,578, that's $1,750 in licensing. The reason, you know, it, it's not that it would inhibit your discussions. If a member of the public comes and records your discussion, audio tapes it, video tapes it, they, they can do whatever they want with it. When we record it, it's a public record, and it falls under public record laws. So we're then required to review and redact information that we can't release as a public record, even though it was stated here publicly. So it requires us to go through every audio tape after every meeting and redact any information that you may have discussed. The point is you're more loose in these meetings and with how you discuss things, and you do say things that if it were a matter of a public record being released and not exempt, then we would have to redact it. And we have to do that if we get a request from the public to have a copy of it. The difference is your Wednesday meetings are very structured. They don't allow you to essentially disclose information that would otherwise be redacted. So if you're talking about some employee issue, somebody's social security number, financial information, there are things that by law we are required to redact. It's not even a choice. There are then things that are, that are our choice whether or not they're disclosed, and then there are things that have to be disclosed. So, what I'll tell you is that $10,578, let me say this first, in 11 years that I've been here, I think we've had three requests for copies of the audio tapes. In the first year, at $10,578, with an average cost of $45 for a request, and the average cost is different. If someone comes in and requests an audio tape of a three-hour meeting, staff have to listen to three hours of meetings to see if there's any redactions versus an hour meeting then it would be you know, less cost. But on an average cost of $45, that means we'd have to have 235 requests a year. Like I said, we've had three or four maybe requests in the 11 years that I've been here. Um, it doesn't stop people from being able to come in and request it. There is a charge uh, to do that. And uh, as I just said, you know, on an average, probably around $45. Uh, and that's because a staff has to sit there and listen to it for an hour or two hours and make redactions and and then burn a copy and provide a CD, and that's what it costs. Um, so, you know, it, it definitely, based on based on the utilization we have so far, is not a, a cost-effective option. The issue of transparency is anyone can come in and get it anytime they want, so it's available. They just have to pay for it. Typically, what the board's past position has been is if something becomes costly enough that it's less expensive for us to invest and do something like this than we would do it. But if it's less expensive based on the small number of requests we get, then we're subsidizing a, a program for a small number of people, basically. Now, I've been told, well, how many requests do you need? I'll get people to come in and request it. I mean, that's probably not a reason for us to do it. I mean, if we have a natural course of request, that's that's one thing. If we have an inflated, purposeful attempt to make us come up with 500 copies of something, of course, that's an issue. And I'll so. never do that. Don't don't you think possibly the limited request is because of the cost? It would limit me requesting it. I couldn't afford that every to, week. To, to be honest with you, the request that we have, people don't know the cost up front. 
it's been after the fact that, so no, I don't think so. It may be for those people that have requested it that don't want to come back and request more because they don't want to pay it, but generally, the public isn't aware that this is what it costs until we actually give them a cost estimate, and we have to do that for each request. And like I said, there's variables that determine what it's going to cost, giving you an average cost of $45. But I mean, it could, you know, some meetings go five hours long, and some meetings require a lot of redaction, which is going to require a lot of software work, which also raises another question because then people all of a sudden are going, Why are you taking stuff out of the audio tape? Um, and, you know, creates suspicion about why we're doing that. Um, and, and as I said, any member of the public can come and report it, and it's their privately owned information then, rather than our public record. There are different rules that apply. So, well, I, I don't know. The so here, we've never had a five-hour meeting, but uh, we've had a four-hour one. We've had <laughs> but um, I just and and also in the email that the administrator sent me said that he was working with IT to determine a, a, a more efficient cost method to meet. This as well. I, I definitely want you to know I've been trying to figure out a way to do this much less expensively and make it happen. Um, you know, we had a request from a prior board member, we got a good request. Uh, the board, you know, we haven't had where two of the three board members have directed us to do this because really this is the cost and the problem is the staff time. I mean, it's, it's hard for me to get the cost of staff time. You know, the other the other thing is there are certain things that staff we're not we're not allowed to charge for this, but we're required to pay for it. When it's an issue that involves a legal decision, well our support staff can go through and uh, redact information that is required to be redacted. There's some things where they have to go consult counsel. And and to be honest with you, the cost that I gave you here doesn't account for that. We can't charge for that. Like under the the agreement, but recently in the public records law, um, local governments and state agencies can't charge for attorney time when used to review public records for um, exceptions to disclosure. So it's a it's a the, the legislatures put that as a cost to be borne. Local government is, is basically the attorney time in responding to these types of requests. And there will be those times, I mean, we would train our staff the best we could to what the requirements are for what we're required to redact, what we can redact. It'll probably be most of the time where it's something we can redact, where they have to go to council and say, do we redact this or not? And, you know, council then has to take their time to do it. So there are other costs. I mean, I tried to give you just a sure. rough estimate. And, you know, um, actually since we last talked, the, the licensing costs increased, unfortunately. In a week? Which, <laughs> no, 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 since the last, Oh, since we talked board, about it. The licensing cost went up uh, to $350 per license. That's another thing that will happen to us. Uh, each time we license something, and you know this with technology, the cost goes up as well. So I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know that there's a lot of room for me to, to get, get you guys a much better cost. I mean, basically, if you want to do it, this is what the, probably what the cost is going to be at a minimum, and then it will go up each year. And it, this cost estimate doesn't reflect those things that we wouldn't be able to charge for. And that's namely, you know, the time of counsel to review inquiries by staff if we, if we need it. Now, the other thing is this only assumes a staff time for each Tuesday and Thursday meeting to review and make the redactions of one hour. So I took an average of meetings saying they're going to last an hour. If they last two hours, Right, if the average is two hours, you can take this support staff time of seventy-seven hundred dollars, and it becomes fourteen thousand, fifteen, you know, fifteen thousand two, fifteen thousand four hundred dollars. So it can very easily go up quickly, depending on how long our meetings go. Um, I just I listed the assumptions so you would you would know the assumptions I used, but and you can extrapolate it based on what you all believe. And some meetings are counted into that average as well. And um, is it unreasonable to say if we did a six-month trial, we would have the licensing and say half the staff time, say about $5,000 trial to see if it's accessed, if it's utilized, if it's beneficial? Well, my guess is actually in the first year, it's going to take a little more staff time than what I actually estimated because they're going to have to be trained and they're going to have to get experience using the software, you know, it's uh, audio editing software. 
Um, and you know, it's going to take time for IT to set them up and answer their questions. So, you know, I just gave you this is a flat cost if we're going along and doing it. There's assumptions I didn't put in here, uh, but you know, it's kind of like uh, when you're a new commissioner and you get an iPad and you don't just get an iPad and know how to do everything on it. It takes a lot of training and time for you to be able to use it. It's the same thing for our staff with a new software program, especially something like this because they're not. We don't. We, we haven't hired people who are trained in, you know, audio technology, did audio digital technology. So my guess is it, it's going to take probably a little more time than I estimated. This was just based on the one hour per meeting for the two meetings per week of them being able to review it. So uh, the licensing you can't buy in a six six month increment. I mean, yeah. you, you pay. What licensing do you need? Uh, why can't um, they just be put in a file on our web page? Because you, you need the soft, it's a software licensing to do the editing to the audio file for the things we're required to do that. You can't just take the audio file and post it. Right. Well, don't we edit them now? I mean, we redact them now. We redact them now, but as I said, we've had three requests in 11 years that I've been here for the audio files. And so we have a program that we can use, and it's very fast to know because she's had to do it. It's very cumbersome and very difficult to use, but because we have minimal requests, we don't go out and buy a program that we're going to use three times in 11 years. We use other technology. That is outdated and old. You know, it is, it is old. I mean, actually, there's been times where, you know, we've needed a copy of a three-hour meeting and the software we have can't even pull three hours worth of time because it's the file's too big for it to be able to modify it, so we have to do it in chunks. But as I said, it's not been an issue because we've had very few requests for it. I'm not saying if it were available that people wouldn't make, look at it more often. I'm not, I'm not arguing that. Mm -hmm. I'm, just, I'm just giving you these are the facts. So, and regardless of cost, and I've said this over and over, it didn't matter if it cost $100,000. If you guys say we're doing it, then we're doing well, it. Well, it wouldn't matter. It costs $100,000. Well, I'm just, yeah. $10,000 even is pretty minimal in light of our budget, but it's significant and it's worth um, the discussion. I'm all for transparency. I think that's a good thing. Um, I do have concerns on several pieces. The annual increase costs, because if you get percentage, it goes up every year. What's it going to look like in 20 years? I always think about 60 months. In the beginning is when my head starts thinking 60 months, and then 120 months and 240 months. What's this program going to look like in that 5, 10, 20 year mark? What are they going to cost going to be down the road? Because what we do today is going to have lasting effects on um, Future, even though we can't bind the board, it's going to have those future um, effects because of the cost, and they're going to have someone else have to deal with it by raining it in if it gets out of control or something. <coughs> and I'm not a big government type of person. My, uh, I have concerns on basic fundamental also, and it's a uh, basic participation in government. Right now, there's almost an apathy sometimes the public, so they don't get involved, they don't come to the meetings, and they, they, uh, they're not here. So is it an attempt to try to bring more people to pay attention to what's happening? Yes, I can see that, but at the same time, some of the people just need to take a moment, like, uh, like Tom and Lee and Linda Motors and the people who are here every day, you know, I have to give you guys credit. You come and you listen and you pay attention, and then they bring that back, in. and that's a good thing. So I'm worried that uh, that these guys will disappear. I, I don't want to see you leave just because it's on audio file. You know, I'd like to see some public participation in our meetings because it makes me believe that somebody cares. Um, and the other part of that is, is I see our staff right now is really, they work really hard. And this is going to add a few hours. How, what's our month, what's the weekly load that's going to add hour-wise to the Well, two meetings. And now already each 52 weeks, 104 hours. Are we looking at? That's if it's an hour. You know, I, I mean. With the workload our staff has now, are we looking at increased FTEs? Or, I mean, that's why my biggest worry is they're already working at, at a very hard maximum capacity. Are we going to have to increase our FTE to be able to accommodate something like this? So I've said Full time this, equivalent. I've, I've said this before. Sorry. Um, 
and I said, <coughs> we, didn't, we began recording these to make it more efficient for our staff to be able to produce minutes. We're not required by any law to record meetings. We're not. We're required to keep minutes, and we're only required to keep minutes regarding the main topics. We're not required to provide detailed minutes. We do. We provide very detailed minutes because we do record them, and anyone can go to the minutes, and if there's something significant that they wanted more detail on, they could come in and request it. Um, moving from the fact that this was meant to reduce the workload to our staff to now adding workload is an issue. I mean, it, it is an issue, and it likely will result at some point in us coming back and saying, you know, it might be 0.25 FTE that we need additionally, at, you know, um, it could be more. I, like I said, it's, I think it would be less than that. I think I made, just for purposes of demonstrating the cost, I made conservative estimates believing that our staff could review, you know, uh, we're almost at an hour now, you know, we're about, still have to work in for them. But they could review to redact information in an hour for every, on average for every meeting they have. I don't know if that's a good estimate or not. It just was for purposes of demonstrating the cost. So if it turns out to be two hours, uh, you, mean, you can do the math. Um, that, you know, $14,000, $15,000 in staff time is almost a half FT for us. So that has to, that's coming from somewhere. That's that's my concern is, is at what point are we gonna have to increase her staff to be able to do this and then we're just increasing the size of government. Yeah and, and I'm not a big government person either. I am one that is responding to the requested needs of the people. And yeah I like people here too, but you know what? there are still a few people who work during the day and they cannot make it. Yeah, I was lucky to make it to one meeting a week and I would have loved to make it all three and there's no way I could do that nor could I afford the audio tapes. And I know we're not required to record them. I think it's great that we have them, we have them available. And if we don't want to do this, maybe we should consider subsidizing the cost of, of a request because we've only had three in the, in the last few years. If people want to request, maybe we should reduce that cost where it doesn't break the bank for someone who is trying to work and hold a job and watch their government and be involved. I mean, there's a couple different ways we can angle it if this is um, cost prohibitive in, in our budget. And it is something we can reevaluate and rein in. It isn't a set in stone program, well, you know, either. Stone, we could do whatever we want. Yeah, yeah, just, those are my concerns. Mm -hmm. so, so, so so our, mm -hmm. our fee structure isn't based on a particular item that someone wants. It's based on the <coughs> cost plus overhead for staff time associated with doing it, whether it be a request for an audio file or a request. I mean, you know the planning documents that you guys get? We have people that request those. Mm -hmm. We don't, you know, whatever staff time it takes plus the cost of the materials is what we charge people. And we don't subsidize those. Since it's based on the global structure of staff time plus materials and supplies, it's very, in fact, I think it could also create a legal issue for us to subsidize this one particular action and not subsidize the other pieces that we charge out the same thing for. So I don't know that technically that's that probably be a question for council, but I think it creates some problems for us. Uh, you know, what we do is when we say, here's what this cost, you know, you guys, we, we provide up what 100% of the cost is in our fee structure. You set what percentage of that amount of 100% of the cost you want to collect from the public versus what part should be paid by the, the general fund, essentially. And you do that for all of our fees. When it comes to staff time and a public request, we've got 100% of a public request. So that's set by you all. If you wanted to reduce that, it would not only just subsidize this, but it would subsidize everything that would involve staff time. So just, you know, and you know, maybe council can look into it differently, but. Uh, I mean, there, there's always the potential um, for challenges when you start um, picking and choosing amongst the sort of the content of what you're looking at um, and whether and how you treat things differently based upon content. Um, 
uh, I can, I'm happy to look to see if I can find any specific guidance. Um, my guess is probably there isn't, but I, I do see that there could, could problems could arise and people could could challenge them. Frequently, we get very large public records requests that require extensive staff time, um, and almost universally, the response is, "Well, I don't want to pay that, but I still want the materials." Um, and so I can see if we are subsidizing staff time because that's the vast majority of what what is the cost of a public records request is staff time. I can see that there would be potential issues if we if we were subsidizing staff time for one type of content but not for in general. So when we say, hey, like I said, we've only had three of these, and relatively speaking, I know it's not a cheap cost for maybe an individual, but relatively speaking, compared to some of the big requests, like the MERS request that we had was thirty or thirty four or thirty six hundred dollars. So you know, and that's a public records request, whether it's from a particular, you know, from someone who's representing someone or an, uh, an individual. So. So uh, on the legal issue then, so picking and choosing what we're um, helping with content would be picking and choosing putting these files online and not other uh, public meetings also fall under that legal concern? Well, I, I guess it's, it's uh, it, there's always challenges when you try to put some stuff online versus what you don't put online. I mean, ultimately the board's decisions sort of have to meet a reasonable person standard. You have to, you have to have reasons for why you're making distinctions between things. And so um, right now, uh, the Wednesday meetings are available online through RVTV because that's the technology that exists to put those online. Um, and, and so could someone come in and say, well, you've put Wednesday on, but you're not putting Tuesday and Thursday on, therefore you're picking and choosing the content? I, I mean, I think that we would have some reasonable arguments to make is to, to explain the difference between where the meetings occur and how the technology exists. Um, and what's discussed. And what's discussed and sort of the, the concerns behind it. Um, but again, there's, there's, always, there's always concerns when um, we look at sort of content of, of what we're if, we're, if we're distinguishing between things not based upon, but based upon content. And that would be one of the, the concerns of this is, you know, we're supposed to treat the, the Oregon statutes really view public records requests as public records requests. It doesn't, it doesn't um, distinguish between what is the record. Um, the, a, a document recorded in a clerk's office is treated the same as a public record as the, the audio file um, of this is the same as the memo that Danny writes to you. I mean, they're all just lumped into this big package of public records. And so if we start looking at this board has adopted a policy of um, cost recovery for public records, and if we start breaking down that policy based upon what is the content, then, then there are, there's the potential for challenges. Not to say that those challenges would be successful, not to say that we couldn't be able to identify and defend why the board has been able to make a distinction or why the board has made distinctions, but it, it does cause the potential for challenges as well, which I think the yeah, yeah, said. And if you chose to direct us to go ahead and you know, facilitate this occurring, I think, you know, each case of whether we spend money to provide something to the public, because we publish things all the time to the public, mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's an evaluation of the public good. So that's why I've told you before, if the benefit outweighs the cost, the board typically has said, you know, for example, you, you all passed the resolution on your opposition to limiting Second Amendment rights. I think we had 30 requests for the document in 15 minutes. Mm -hmm. Now, if we had had one request for that document, it would have been less expensive for us to just provide the one copy to the one request. But it becomes more cost effective once we get to a certain number, and it depends on what issue we're talking about and how much it costs, to post it publicly online. And so we have we have, we do have a way to defend that. I guess is what I'm telling you. Oh, I see. Mm -hmm. And in this case, you know, as I said, three requests, which cost forty five dollars each, versus spending ten thousand dollars, ten thousand five hundred seventy eight dollars, which would require two hundred and thirty five requests. Uh, it it it's it's not the same argument as, for example, the document, the you know, Second Amendment document we published. And there's been various documents that we have not recorded, the board has said, you know, I'll usually come to the board and say, hey, 
we got 400 requests for this. And so it's costing us more money and, and the citizens more money than if we just post it. That usually doesn't happen when we have things that are made in small numbers, requests that are made in small numbers. There are also legal arguments, and actually people do contest our fees mostly when they determine that they believe it's in the public good that it be released. They'll go over to court and challenge whether or not they should have to pay the fees. Um, those usually have to do with large records requests where, I mean, we've had some of the ACLU has requested $15,000 in cost worth of records, and they want us to go back 20 years of all of our archives and pull every file that has to do with everything that ever had to do with the jail. And so we're spending, and, and honestly, in most cases, it's a fishing expedition. Let's see if there's anything we can find in their records that we can use. And so, but they'll say, hey, it's in the public good to know if anything happened in the jail, we shouldn't have to pay. $20,000 and they'll go over to court and we can agree to reduce the cost to avoid litigation or we can go over and fight the cost. So there's all sorts of different levels of why we charge and why we don't charge and okay. what people can do about it. Well, I brought it to you because I do feel that personally the benefit does outweigh the cost and I'm not a big spending person <laughs> as represented by my standard salaries. So, um, and you can stand to disagree and we can move on or whatever you want to do. But I, I have two questions. I had this is more towards uh, Joel and Manny. Um, we have a fee schedule, correct? And we approve that fee schedule every every year as part of and part of that is how much we're charging for different fees throughout the county. Would it be what I think this might touch on what you're trying to achieve, but is there a possibility to be able to put uh, the audio recording in the fee schedule and say it's going to be $10? Uh, that, you mentioned subsidy, and that's why that sort of triggered my head. Can you, is there a possibility we can just put it in the fee schedule and say this audio recordings of these meetings will be this much, and then set that uh, annually on the board order as we do all of our other fee schedules? Well, it would conflict. That's the problem with how you see people. We've been challenged three times right. in court about how we derive our fees. We've won every time. Right. We've won every time because we're consistent. This would create an inconsistency. Okay. Not only because you would be charging less, but because the basis for our fee structure doesn't necessarily look at the item. The basis and costing for our fee structure doesn't look at the item. It looks at the elements of preparing whatever it is we're asked to prepare. Staff time, overhead, materials, so it was subject to potential litigation. Well, that was Joel's point. Yeah, I, I mean, and again, it does, it does, and it doesn't just open up a challenge on the cost of providing the audio itself. I would imagine it challenges our whole feature. Yeah, right? that that would be my concern. Is, yeah, no one's. I don't think anyone's going to challenge that we're going to charge less for the recording. My concern would be is that that's going to open up. You're charging less for the recording, so why are you charging? more for the other 99.999% of things. Well, the basis of how you cost for these things are these elements. Well, you're talking to the guy who doesn't like fees to begin with, so. Well, I'm just answering your question. Yeah. No, I mean, I mean but I, I, honestly, really, I, this doesn't, if you all told me to make this happen, I'll make, we'll make it happen. Yeah. I mean, it's, no, but. So let me sort of set, because understanding how that works, understanding the legal piece, that's why I wanted to bring it in this sort of scenario. One of the things I've always felt was important to, is to go electronic. You got an experience of that over the city of Medford. Mm -hmm. Having electronic documents to begin with uh, makes things easier for transparency in government. Um, yeah, I guess. Uh, well, if I'm timing it, let, okay. me, let me finish my time. <laughs> right, um, so, could that be wrapped into a discussion on a bigger picture? Because look, we. we, we Basically, I understand $10,000, $13,000 is a drop in the bucket of $320 million budget. It's really insignificant. And is the money there to do it? Yes. The way, what we've done over the last few years to, to eliminate deficit spending and that kind of stuff has really had a, a, a big impact on our financial stability as we go forward. Um, so is the money there to do it? Yeah, I, I see we have that ability. Is, do we want to put too much and we start doing all these projects that's because we have money? Not necessarily. Uh, 
but at the same time, how do we take and move our organization, because that's what I think you're trying to do, move it into the 21st century, so to speak, with that transparency concept, how, how do we be more open with the public? And I've always believed that that basic concept of going electronic, because there's costs to producing every all the papers, there's costs to all that kind of stuff, and maybe that could all be put into one discussion that we could, and maybe even, maybe even something like that would even cover the audio piece with the licensing. So because what I get complaints on is sometimes the, the press is going, well, we don't have the supporting documents that you get in your package. They just get the agenda and everything else, but it no, 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 no. We've, we've made it electronic where they can pull up the board letter and the supporting documents that support what your agenda items are. I'm just saying, yeah. some of them have made that comment to me, that's all. Well, if they, they, they not access it or not, it's, it's their deal. But I do. I've always been able to get the but, supporting documents. So that's what I'm wondering, would you be interested in sort of taking having a bigger discussion on this thing? I'm not sure I see the need uh, because everything is on, on the web page but this portion. Okay. Um, the documents are on there, the supporting documents are on there, and they could be accessed. So this is the only thing that can be accessed of what we do in government. Well, it can be accessed, it's just not, yeah. someone has to request it. Right. That's right. Let me look a little bit deeper into it, if you don't mind. Okay. I, what I really want to find out before I say yes or no is, is what's the long-term effect? I want to know in 60 months from now how much this is going to be estimated to cost. Um, in, and are we prepared to go down that road with FTE increased potential and everything? I want to look at the full piece, but I don't see any potential FTEs on this. And I want to get that full, full picture on it, as we discussed it. So, and I think volunteers are important, and I would yeah. want to see that within a year. I, I don't want to see it in 60 months. I want to look at it in a year, what our cost is, how effective was the program. And right. I think it's an important piece of this. Yeah. But yeah, I think the benefit's there. Yeah, personally. I understand Danny's concerned about only three requests, and this is the cost of it. That, that, and you know, we're going to spend this much for the three requests, you know. But let me, let's, let me look at the, the bigger picture of what it's going to cost us down the road. And, Increasing it because it's not just what's happened this year to do it. We might have we might have room and staff time to be able to do that, but are we going to have room and staff time next year, the following year? At what point do they become overburdened and we have to increase? And that's kind of where the, the I want to take a, a longer approach. Well, I wouldn't say we have room and staff time to do it now. Just to be honest with you, it, it's going to require us to do something about staffing. Okay, and I'd like to have information on our FDEs before I make a decision. Well, I'd just like to compare for one person to request um, one meeting a week, which isn't a. I I've spoke. I know a League of Women Voters said uh, lots of times Thursday they can't come. One one meeting a week is about one hundred four dollars a month if it's a twenty six dollar minimal tape cost, and that's the cost of our program. That's ten thousand dollars over ten thousand a year. Is there any other local government in Jackson County that's doing this? I don't really care. I'm I deter to this one. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm asking that question. I have no clue. Because if somebody else is doing it, we can see what they've done, what the reality is. That's why I'm looking at I it as I believe Karma Falls puts theirs on, um, on their website, but I'll check with um, yeah. them over there. We, 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 sure. we, we do post minutes from every meeting, and as I said, they're detailed. They're taken from the recordings. They're not word for word, but they're very detailed. They, provide adequate information as required by public <coughs> records laws about the topics and decisions that are made at the board meetings. Um, and if someone looks at something and wants more detail, they can come in and request it. So the inform it's not that the information is getting right. out there. Um, the other thing is, you know, I get really nervous about comparing ourselves to other counties. A lot of other counties do things that I mean, technically aren't legal. I mean, I know many counties who violate public meetings laws. I know many counties who release documents that they're not supposed to release based on restrictions. You know, I've seen it. And I will say that you all know we try to keep our agenda tight. We try to make sure you're staying on what we've agendized. And so I don't know that looking at other local governments, and especially Klamath Falls or Josephine County or someplace like that would be the model that I would su suggest you compare what we would do to because we wouldn't be that loose. Um, 
Yeah, it I mean, is. It's like comparing one county to another. It's I would like to see practical, it, but like to see what other people do. Mm -hmm. You know, like, who does this? What's what? How they get there? What's their um, cost associated with it? Are they subsidizing the program? What's what's their what's their uh, effects over a period of time? Have they noticed an increase with the public participation? Have they got what the public comment is as a result of doing it? And how much interaction they've gotten, yeah. not even how they've done it, but how has it reached out to the people? It has it, it, is it, is it effective and what, is it worth the money and is it effective of what they're trying to accomplish? Okay, so we'll revisit yeah. it then. Yeah. Um, okay, I'm sorry, and if anybody else is on board. <laughs> I'll keep trying. Less expensive. All right, it's pretty, it's pretty bare bones. Ten thousand, I think it's you know seven to ten thousand, kind of is the range we're looking at. It's not unaffordable, and it's oh, it's, it's really when we get a good thing for what we do in reaching out to the citizens we serve. Right. Oh. I just need more information than what's okay. If you reach out as well, and we'll, oh, we'll put on the agenda again. So. Okay. Third thing on the agenda is the discussion of the use of staff time and county resources for non-county business. And this is Commissioner Breidenbaugh. We're kind of, uh, this is kind of coming out of our liaisons from the other day when we were talking about what is, as a commissioner, a lot of times we do a lot of things that we wouldn't normally do if you weren't a commissioner, so or in the position. Uh, going to different meetings, going to different events, and uh, participating with uh, basically the people. And how do we find ways to be able to balance that uh, with our participation with the public at these different programs and still meet public meeting law and still be able to be transparent with the public in all those aspects. So. We, when our, during liaisons, we kind of decided that we we're going to agendize this one to have discussion because we thought it was important because uh, previous boards are, um, had all treated this differently with scheduling and stuff. So this is what it revolves around is basically our schedules and, and how we address those types of things. Um, previous discussions are let's, let's anything we do, have staff put on the calendar. This is the previous boards. We calendarize things. Yeah, it helps get us prevent from being um, in a position where that where the public might think that we're in a public meeting, but we're not. So everything is published in our uh, even when we go to AOC, we I did, we publish the fact that we make it a public meeting even though there's exclusions under Oregon law that they don't have to be published under AOC. We just go the extra mile to be the transparent organization. Um, so, and that I got the feeling that at the time that the board decided that we wanted to, uh, if it's a something that's not on our liaison assignment, that we schedule it ourselves. So we're we're identifying our liaison assignments as the areas in which staff is allowed to uh, schedule our schedule. I'm correct is that so kind of what we had a general consensus of the I think it's more than liaisons if it's about um, like like going to the um, chamber luncheon it's not my liaison but it's get scheduled on the schedule by staff so well, I don't know specifically well, that, that's exactly what I'm talking about uh, if when we the liaison is kind of consensus that it was your liaison assignments staff focuses on that and that's where your staff time to be used and that's the chamber luncheon we're a member of the chamber, um, but that's what we give you. That's what allows staff to do it because we're a member of the Medford Chamber. But if you went to the Ashland Chamber, that wouldn't be allowed because we don't. They're not. That would be considered a non-county function because Ashland Chamber is not where we have our membership. Or the Eagle Point of the Rogue Chamber. Yeah. I put on my own schedule. Because those are my own little busy things I do. Can I clarify a couple things? Certainly. There, there's not been a difference in how commissioners do this. We have a policy, and it says that county resources won't be used for personal purposes. Commissioner Bridenthal asked staff first to RSVP himself and his wife 
for a dinner at Sustainable Valley, which had nothing to do whatsoever with county business. Originally, the county seat funded Sustainable Valley, but we provide no funding. We aren't a member. We don't participate on the board. And staff said, you know, our policy prohibits us from RSVP and you and your wife uh, for this. <coughs> Commissioner Bradenthal asked also that staff, I think the word was schedule, maybe register, but I think it was schedule him for an event. I don't remember the exact event, but also something that wasn't county related. And we have a policy that prohibits it. So um, Commissioner Bridenthal brought up, well, aren't we using staff resources if we put it on our counter? Counter way is a way for you all to let people know where you're going to be. Mm -hmm. um, and as council said, uh, likely appropriate. But when we start using staff resources to make scheduling for things that are personal to you, then that becomes an issue. Um, um, it, it comes an issue with our policy. So if you're, I just want to make sure this isn't a difference in well, what we Well, clarify, done. you basically said that I asked for something that wasn't a county function. And because I received that invitation for the Sustainable Valley piece, and I had no idea that we weren't part of that Sustainable Valley piece anymore. So when I'm asking to schedule me, I'm thinking of something that we're still participating with, and to do that, because that's been the practice, is, so it wasn't necessarily that I went out there to try to do something and use staff time to schedule something. Yeah, time. I wasn't about that. Well, I just kind of came across that. But, um, so understanding what is county resources or, or, or county function and what's not a county function, and just clarifying that stuff. So I'm having that so we don't have this confusion. So, and identify and say, okay, if you're going to the Eagle Point Chamber, and I'm going to the Eagle Point Chamber because I got invited for something. Over the last three years, I basically said, yeah, Vanilla or whoever staff, I'm, I'm going to the Eagle Point Chamber, and please schedule that time period. And so now what we're basically, what we're saying is that we're going to schedule that ourselves because that's not part of the county function. But I just want to make sure that we're having a very candid conversation because when we go down here, we are going to be responsible at this point, if a personally responsible, in my opinion, if we both show up at the same event and we fail to put that on our calendar and somebody perceives that we are in a public meeting. There's no, in my opinion, there's no safety check. Just well, just, just because something is on your calendar does not mean that public meeting law notices have been met. So if both of you were to show up at the Eagle Point Chamber and were to discuss or deliberate something towards which the board would make a final decision, so all those lawyer words, um, just having it on your calendar would not uh, satisfy the public meeting requirements. Um, I do agree with Commissioner Breidenthal. It is on um, the individual commissioners to ensure that um, meetings of, of, of a quorum of the board um, and, and unfortunately, we have only three people on the board, unfortunately, to guess how it, but the quorum is two of you. So anytime there's two of you in a room and there's deliberation or discussion towards a, the final decision the board would make, you've got a quorum. So or receiving input or, or something. That's part of the deliberations, yeah. the receiving input. Um, it's tough, but I mean, putting it on the, on the, the, the county calendar for uh, COA staff or COA, uh, CAO or BSC staff isn't going to, I guess, address the public meeting Concerned if it's a matter of public meeting, then it is a matter of public business, and we do notice it. So that has nothing to do with your calendar or whether or not staff register you for something. Mm -hmm. If you tell staff that we're, well, and let me let me speak to Lynette or other staff. When a commissioner comes to one of them and says do something, they typically do it. That doesn't mean that what they did complied with policy or not, but you have quite a bit of influence and authority when you come and tell staff to do something. And it's not until one of the staff go, hey, this is kind of weird, I'm being asked to do this, is this okay? That we go, well, you shouldn't have been doing that or that's not okay. So if staff have done that for you, Doug, for personal reasons, it does violate county policy of using staff resources for doing it. It doesn't make it right because they did it. And that that's the whole point of you know bringing the issue forward. Is this, this, that's the whole point of this discussion. You keep saying it violates county policy or whatever. Here's the, here's the gist of it. We are taking responsibility 
to making sure it's publicly noticed. And that kind of got bypassed. My point is being bypassed here in this, when you guys did that. It was, we're taking responsibility for that public notification at this point in time. And having this on our calendar, or having staff ensure that this is on the calendar, many times in the last three years that I've been here, because of this, it's been caught. And the staff that says, you're both scheduled for this, we haven't publicly noticed this. Do you want it publicly noticed? And the, because of that's the way it was being done, it's, it's actually saved us to make sure that public notification has gone out. But you With actually that, have an agenda okay, item me, to discuss me, this every week. Yeah. Review of calendars. And if we forget something, or if we forget to put it or if we have something because we're so buried in other work that we didn't do that part 100%, and it results in a public meeting, then we're the ones that are held accountable to that. And so that, I was just saying that safety check or that checkpoint is no longer there to someone basically saying, okay, this is this is this. So I just want to make sure that we're clear that we're taking on that responsibility ourselves. So if there's that there, we can't ever sit back and say, well, I, I that will be in front of whatever. I think the safety check's still there, Doug. It just requires you to put it on your calendar rather than use staff resources to do it. And I, I agree. I'm not confused over it. I haven't had a confusion on it yet. <laughs> but um, because I do take care of my personal on my calendar. For instance, the fair board meeting. And I've had that put on the calendar. I've had it noticed because occasionally I want to go to those because we have the new appointments. And I've put on my calendar, but staff has noticed it. And you even said, has this been noticed? If it has been noticed, I should leave. And that's the responsibility we take. Putting on our calendar, leave if it isn't noticed, and making sure it is noticed. And we do it with our calendars. We do it with our calendars we speak about at this um, Thursdays. I don't think it's, to me, it's not a problem. And I don't have a problem taking care of that on my calendar. It's not a problem until you have, here's an example. You're now on the ONC board. The ONC board has always met traditionally on a Thursday. You're going to miss meetings uh, at some point in time to be able to attend those meetings. And recently I was in the press because I missed so many meetings. They didn't report that I was attending ONC meetings or other meetings in the place of. They just said that I was missing a meeting. You miss that meeting. You're not there to say, hey, this needs to be calendared. And when nobody knows about it. And if you miss it's because you may or may not have it. So that's why I just wanted to be sure that there are gaps that you're gonna we're gonna have to take responsibility for here because there's meetings you're gonna miss because you're attending other meetings that are just as important to the county and you're not gonna be able to sit there and say this is calendared and then we show up and we take that responsibility. So we're gonna have to say we're gonna have to come up with something as a board, just like we did at the fair board the other night, says, Hey, is this calendar? And, and, and I made sure it was. So right. I think that's the responsibility we take. The more we take on, the more responsibility we have with it. And uh, have you had so a problem it with it being a, a conflict? It wasn't there was there, there was the first few years we had a few conflicts and things, and, and I looked at the other commissioners and we noticed. And no, uh oh, okay. So and then one leaves. It's no big deal. Yeah, if you miss it, you leave. Or dis or dissipate or do things. You know, there's ways to to deal with it, but. Um, I just wanted to make sure that we're aware of all that because I have had those conflicts in the past and that's kind of why we did the way we did it. So, uh, well, I, don't, I don't want to see those I don't agree with changing. I don't agree with changing our policy. I don't agree with putting more on the staff unless it's putting our audio on file. <laughs> <laughs> that's a <laughs> <laughs> I think I can take care of my schedule. And if, and if you don't know how we don't find, you know, ask. Don't know how? Oh. Well, I don't know what the problem is, so I don't know. I don't have any problem putting mine on. And if we have a conflict, we'll do, let's deal with it and see if we need to change things at that point. Both of these instances that I'm aware of, and there's probably other ones with other commissioners too. But oh, I don't know I, yeah, you singled me out. Yes. I kind of felt that way. Well, I singled you out because it was your issue, and I wanted to explain why it staff was said agenda. it was on the agenda. But, um, you know, both of these issues were of the result of two or three emails exchanging. And to be honest with you, it takes about 10 seconds to put it on your calendar yourself. 
it took more time and effort to send an email telling someone RSVP me and my wife for this or whatever the issue is than it does just to open up the calendar and put it on your calendar. It takes more of your time and their time. And as I said, unless it's related to county business, and that's also a question because they look at things that you guys give and you may, in your mind, know it's related to county business somehow. They look at it and go, I don't understand how this is related to county business. I don't even know what this is. Mm -hmm. So it's, you know, it's, it's, it honestly creates more work than just putting it on your calendar yourself. Um, this wasn't just about putting something on calendars, though. This was RSVPing with an event outside and putting it on a calendar. Uh, well, to that, like I said, I thought we were still involved with sustainable balance, so I would thought it was following policy on it. You keep going back to that one. But. Well, even if that were the case, Doug, in that case, RSVP, you would be appropriate, but not your wife. And you had asked for both. So, you know, it's, it would be better for you to do it yourself, and then there's not a conflict there. And, and, and obviously, there's lots of things we'll learn as we go when we ask. For this to be done, let's say, well, that's my county code. Okay. Because <laughs> a lot of things I don't know either, as well, if it's county business or not. Well, and I said, we can take said this a lot of times if you disagree that staff should be doing something or not, you just bring it to the board and the board can direct us. Mm -hmm. we're, but, but for that, we're going to follow what the policy says and or the ordinance. And what is county business? That definition defined. I mean, as a commissioner, the county business is a lot different than it is as an administrator. You have a lot different business that you do. And as a commissioner, it's a lot different than a planning director or a corrections director or anything else. Your job is totally different than what's considered county businesses. So in my opinion, totally different at times. Because you have a whole different perspective on how things are done. So showing up to different events and meetings that you wouldn't normally do because you're a commissioner, to stay in touch, stay informed, having information gathering from a lot of different sources is part of being a commissioner. So what is county business? Well, for instance, the Lincoln Day Dinner is not county business. Right. But I'm going as a commissioner. I do not expect the staff to make my reservations for me, my husband, or my table. And I, But it will be noticed in case there's other commissioners there. You know, But I wouldn't probably be going had I not been a commissioner. Really? Yeah. So, you know, it's it. I, was, I don't see it as an issue. Right. Farm bureau, mm -hmm. farm bureau meeting. Is that county business? Technically, no. Is it a place where you gather a lot of information that helps you in the decision making process as a commissioner? Yes. If and you're if you're going there to talk to them about a deprivation committee, then it's county business. You're, it's something that you're responsible for. If you're going just to have the dinner and listen, then that's different. Yeah, if you're attending, that's what I'm trying to say. If you're attending and you're just back gathering information based on something that's going on somewhere, you know, it, it may or may not pertain to an ordinance down the road or may, you know, it's hard to say. I mean, the GMO issue went to a lot of, a lot of farm bureaus or cattlemen association meetings to listen to what's being said. And just understanding where they stood on the issue. And I agree. We both went to that last Farm Bureau meeting. Mm -hmm. I made my own reservation. I put it on my calendar. It was noticed because we both were there. All with county policy. I think it worked fine. So, just making sure. I just want to be completely clear. So. Anything else? Mm -hmm. Okay. So, input from county council? Uh, nothing. Input from the county administrator reviewing agenda items for the February 10th PLC meeting. Okay, we'll have uh, our annual special presentation on the airport day to see report that's um, earned each year. Uh, he usually kind of makes that a little bit exciting. <laughs> Creative, anyway. One year he came dressed as Elvis when he did it or something. So. Uh, consent calendar dismissed from your January 28th meeting. Um, under dis discussion deliberation, basically two issues, first reading, second, uh, scheduling second reading public hearing, creating and adding in our ordinance the County Wolf Advisory Committee. 
Um, because uh, you know, our ordinance wouldn't be effective until 60 days after the second reading, and because the uh, grant application came out yesterday um, without any real prior notice, and the grant application is due February 29th, um, we are also at the same time asking you to pass an emergency ordinance that would adopt it right away and be repealed upon the final ordinance. And we're doing that exception under health and safety, safety meaning we can qualify for funds. I do will tell you that I think all we'll be able to qualify for is about $500 to do to help pay for the cost of supporting the staff time and the committee itself in this first round. Uh, because you won't have a committee designated who have identified uh, uh, compensation rates and compensation rates and uh, uh, all of the things that they have to identify in order for us to ask for money, uh, including prevention and all of those types of things. <clears throat> so we're asking to pass an emergency, in my opinion, for $500, but it's, you know, worth it to me because it's something that we don't have to incur a cost for, or at least a portion of it we don't have to cost and incur a cost for. So you'll have the regular ordinance and then the emergency ordinance, which is the exact same ordinance. I will bring to you, I think it's at the 17th, it's a Wednesday, right? Mm -hmm. The 17th meeting in order authorizing us to apply for the grant application. So that will fall. Uh, the, the grant application, literally, we got notice yesterday, and the due date is February 29th, so. I wonder if it's going to be February 29th of every year. <laughs> I, I doubt it. <laughs> it will be very um, The next one is uh, order authorizing amendment number one to commercial lease with uh, living opportunities. This is. You guys approved two of these yesterday in your board meeting for space at our health and human services building. It's an annual revenue of $5,040. It is coming to you, even though it's only a year contract, because it's an extension to the currently existing year contract by amendment. The amount wouldn't require your, your authority, your approval, but the, the time is that exceeding a year. And then the other one is that we're authorizing an application for real and personal property tax exemption approval with the Motorcycle Riders Association. So they're pretty much the only motorcycle club in the state that owns property and they receive grants actually from Oregon State Parks and Recreation for operation and maintenance of the property that they own, in, in which they use to uh, operate and maintain toilet facilities, road access, trail maintenance, signage. Uh, etc. Uh, they also provide trash cleanup day each year on their property plus on the surrounding BLM property that abuts trails or connects trails between BLM and the privately owned property. Uh, they do roads, maintenance, trail maintenance, grooming and brush removal along with that on both BLM and their own land it's with BLM's organization. Um, Toilet cleaning weekly, road, train signing, culvert cleaning, fencing, dead tree thing, camping area maintenance, sediment pond clean out. Uh, they maintain two trail bridge crossings. Uh, they have a helicopter landing site, um, but they maintain uh, water supply maintenance, just numerous other activities that go along with people that all ride up there. Um, most, well, all, almost all the members donate their heavy equipment for special tasks. They own three different trail machines for developing and maintaining the trails. They qualify as a 501c3. Um, they've applied for personal and real property tax exemption under ORS 307115, which is property purchased by nonprofit corporations for public park use. So it's actually a statutory reference that allows this. And they do meet the requirements of that specific ORS. 307.115, it's actually subparagraph 2, in case you are interested in looking it up. The term of the real and personal property tax exemption will be July 1st of 2016 through June 30th of 2026. That time limit is specified in the statute as well. They can always come back and reapply that. 
what happens is the assessor's office, they require to follow some established guidelines for calculating the Avalon property tax. Um, and they, in this case, based on the calculation, proposed a tax exemption in the collective amount of $3,874.72 annually. The exemption covers include 715.11 acres of motorcycle rider association properties. And then I have the specific tax lots, which I won't read to you unless you really, really want detailed information. So, I don't know if you have any questions on that or not. Have we haven't given this to the past, the exemption? Yes. Okay. And they're, they're basically going for nonprofit status. Mm -hmm. So that's a, that's a change. They haven't been nonprofit status. They qualify as a 501c3, and because their activities are for public park use, they don't limit the use to MRA. Anyone okay. from the public can go up and use it. That's what qualifies it for. It doesn't mean you have to give it, but it qualifies it for, and they ask for, and they do provide a pretty significant public service. At, Where's you know, that? Oh, um, John's Peak. John's Peak. Oh. Now, I'm a life member of the MR MRA Motorcycle Riders Association. Have been for a long time. Do I have to declare anything as a good enough now? Um, if there was. He has the same benefit as anyone else from it. Yeah, I, I mean, I would say probably not um, because you're not. Solely individually. Solely individually gaining a benefit related to this decision. Um, and it's not, it's probably not a business to which you're, you'd be considered affiliated with. I mean, if you're concerned in an abundance of caution, you can disclose a potential conflict, um, but a potential conflict doesn't, does not exclude you from voting on it, but you might want to just disclose. I don't think you need to, but in an abundance of caution, you might want to disclose. That's one of those, uh, that's one of those non-county business meetings I go to all the time with their board meetings that this is what's going on because that's such a significant impact to the county. Yeah, but I mean, if you are, if you're, if you're concerned about it, at, at most it would likely be a potential conflict unless you were somehow personally benefiting from this. But I, I probably Some, that, something that I would get that no one else would get. Correct. Out. Something, but yeah, but something you or a family member would personally be getting, or that very few people were like, if they yeah. were saying, hey, if you pass this, we'll give you two thousand dollars worth of free whatever, and that's from yeah, the, nothing like that. Okay. So I just want to make sure. Yeah. You know, just my, my advice to you would be just state what you just stated and declare as a potential and then just then you can go over right. If anyone has any questions or challenges to it, you're, you've covered yourself. Okay, anything else? Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, yeah. Yeah. Oh, oh, liaisons. Liaisons. Yeah. oh my gosh, that's my schedule. <laughs> <laughs> I'm done. You, you do have more. <laughs> we just do. Want to jump to executive session. Well, no. your prize in your chair. I lost my calendar. My schedule. Okay, so liaison on committee reports. Do you want to start? I can. I have a, before, AOC was a very busy meeting on Monday. Very busy meeting. Uh, I have three things from Oh, let me get back here. Senator Roblin, Senator Hansel, uh, Representative Bentz, Representative Nathan, uh, Governors, Governors representatives. Uh, I could go on. I think there's a few more. Kozanski didn't wasn't able to show up on the gun stuff. But um, anyway, I had a lot of briefings on all the pieces of legislation that are in the process of coming down. And I, I'll give you guys. I, all the stuff that's in, but I think the uh, positions that were taken at AOC are now, if they're not posted, they should be posted by now on where the AOC stands on everything. Um, one of the things on the public lands policy committee that we did do that I wanted to highlight was we reaffirmed resolution 2015-L1, which is basically the request for the study of the transfer of certain federal lands to the state of Oregon. So the association is still taking the position that the, uh, we need to start the discussion on what the cost benefit analysis would be to start moving the federal lands in the state of Oregon over to state ownership. Uh, understanding that it's illegal to do it back down to the county level, but it's legal to do it from federal to state level. So we're still trying to get the legislature, and that's one of the things that we're working on in this session.
and again get the legislator to fund that study because that's the beginning of any type of process. A lot of it revolved around what happened in Eastern Oregon and Hardy County. Uh, judge Gratzky, uh, who is the judge for Hardy County, basically took some time and wanted to thank the participation from the other commissioners and the sheriffs across the state who participated in the, uh, helping him in keeping his community safe and secure as all this was happening in Hardy County. Well, we did have deputies on the ground, so I wanted to relay his his gratitude for sending those resources to support him. Um, but that transfer is one that we want to keep going. We'll, we'll, we're going to maintain that moving forward. Going from year to year. Uh, we went through the resolutions that we're looking for at the state level, I mean at the national level. The state of Oregon Association of Counties has taken the lead, and we've done it for several years now, uh, basically working with the National Association on coordination. So basically, we, we've redone our resolution, our federal resolution with NACO, urging all federal agencies to engage in exclusive coordination with state, local, and tribal governments. This is basically surrounding a lot of the stuff that we've been working on that uh, I don't know if you're aware of that NACO resolution uh, that we've done over the last few years. And what that does, it allows uh, time and resources of staff to be spent at the national level to, uh, to work on that coordination piece and get it to where we want to see it. Uh, Jackson County plus several other counties have um, been the ones that have helped develop that resolution and I've carried it forward into NACO for the last several years and will continue to do that. Also, the, the other resolution on there is amending our Title, title three of our SIS funds, Superior Rural Schools funds, uh, basically to allow, to expand the usage of those Title three funds for reimbursement of patrol expenditures. So essentially, we can, there's a lot of counties out there that have these, a large pot that don't have the ability to spend it because of all the restrictions that are placed on those Title III funds. And what they'd like to do is be able to use those to um, hire law enforcement because of, uh, of uh, there's a belief that if we have more law enforcement on the ground in the federal lands, that the government isn't going to be so restrictive in the policy that they're coming down with. One of the and, uh, travel management, I think you were there when I think you were there when we talked about the travel management plan for our local forest and what Robert Porter was doing on that dispute resolution piece. And you noticed that big law enforcement um, discussion saying if we had more law enforcement, we wouldn't have these problems with people destroying things and we'd have the ability to get things under control. But this they're shutting things down because they want to maintain or limit the damages. So it's kind of like, what's the real problem and where is the money to be reallocated to be able to prevent the damages to keep everything open for the public as much as possible? So, so that's where the discussion on the Title III's are. Why, why are they doing this when we haven't had Title III funding for two years? Because there is no Title III They're sitting on... Yeah, but anything anyone's sitting on by law has to have been obligated. They're looking... Or they can't have it. So, like you stated earlier, every county does things differently. And there's counties out there that are looking for retroactivity and building this. Retroactivity? Mm -hmm. And there's... And just based on fund balances, because there's no Title three funding anymore. Right. Based on fund balances, you're right on. But there seems to be a flavor to be able to address it and do something with it. So, if there were Congress who wanted to pick it up and... Mm -hmm. Just, just, just yeah. for Title Three. For Title Three. Yeah. Just, just so you know, it would mean nothing to Jackson. Right. Yeah, it's not. Yeah. We don't. We, well, we utilize fund balance, but no, they're no, obligated. Tax. Yeah, we do oh. have a Title Three fund balance, but federal law under Title Three required at the end of the last appropriation, which was two years ago, that you have to have the funds obligated. In other words, you've already said what you're going to use them for. You can keep them as long as you've obligated them to use them for that purpose. So, not everybody's as, as proactive as Jackson County is. 
So they're trying to change, that you can change the purpose? Right. So it, it, it's basically, they're very restricted on what they can and can't be used for. For us, they're mostly used in search and rescue, and for us, they'll be spent down in the next two years. One of the things is you're not, you can't buy supplies. You can't buy a rope anticipating a search and rescue. You can only buy a rope during a search and rescue, before that search and rescue. <coughs> so that's the way that's the way the law is interpreted by a lot of counties. Mm -hmm. You can buy it and then get reimbursed when you use it. That's Title Three works on a reimbursement basis. Right. So I wouldn't say you can't buy. You, you can buy stuff, but you only get reimbursed by Title Three if you use it. Everybody interprets that differently. I've had that discussion with a lot of commissioners across the state, and I've used that same argument, and they've been told, well, my council said I can't do that. Mm -hmm. So they're, they're stuck with what their rules are. So they're trying to get re really clear, defined rules on that so that there's nothing, there's no possible anybody crying foul. And that's at the federal level. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So yeah, we're, we're, the, we're, the hour, we're the middle of the hourglass. Everything comes to us before it happens. <laughs> uh, legislative concept 277 is, gonna, is coming through, and that's going to be removing the wolves from the state endangered species list. Um, they, they've already been removed. Not, they, not legislatively. The yeah. action was taken through the agency. So what's going to happen? What they're doing here is they're taking the agency is being sued by environmental groups, the same environmental groups that basically agreed to the wolf plan. The wolf plan remains in effect and will not change. With and the still provides the same protection. the protection. However, the environmental groups are now suing the state based on the agency's decision to delist. What the what the uh, legislature will be doing in this concept will be affirming that decision by legis through legislation, basically removing any potential for litigation. Because this is now a legal law deal, not just an agency decision. So Although, even with legislation, we can still fight under the Indigenous Species Act. Right. But there, there's always something out there that this is a step to be able to create. Yeah, so this is, this is a positive piece, I see. Uh, with all this crazy stuff that's coming out, there's one positive piece. Um, those are the big ones that came out of the public lands, natural resources. Um, we did have some vital actions, and we did uh, discuss some of the principles of the forest management reformation reform legislation, and uh, that's part of the package. And all is that for county trust lands, state forest? Yeah, it's, it's basically all state lands. Anything the state can use. Looking at the principles. No, it's, it's for federal forest management uh, reform legislation. What the principles are that we want when we see that. So if we look in, if we send AOC or let's say, let's say I'm representing AOC, that's what I do. I sit on the National Public Lands uh, Committee with NACO. You know, that list of principles for federal forest management reform is is the list of principles that I go by. I don't use my own information, that's the way it has to happen. Just like if we say, uh, Commissioner Roberts, we want you to go represent us on OEC, and this is the principles we want you to run under. <coughs> so same concept. Um, uh, very good, I think it's a, a very positive, coordination-based, um, uh, local control-based concept in bringing that around so those principles are in line with Jackson County's philosophy. And I encourage you to take a good look, hard look at them. They're all on the AOC websites um, because that's the official. Yeah. Um, so it's information in there. We'll over that. Uh, on the public safety side, DPSST made a presentation that was really interesting. They're looking for funding, increased funding to DPSST, and I thought it was important to bring this back and discuss it because we're having some of the same issues with our jail. Uh, being able to hire people, mm -hmm. as you're well aware of. But um, 
they knew they they were asking for additional funding of a couple million dollars, 2.5 million, to increase the classes for the state for the academy classes. Uh, this uh, we have currently in the state of Oregon, we did a, a, a look into it, and we have vacant positions that are not enrolled in DPSSD basic courses, uh, academies. Uh, law enforcement police, there's 425 vacancies statewide right now. Corrections have 199 at the county level that are vacant right now. We're just about, what, four or five of those. Um, parole and probation has 55, and telecommunication, dispatchers, telecommunications, 113 vacant positions. Those are all DPSST certified positions and to even be in the field. And then they took another hard look at um, the people that are eligible to retire in 2016. And there's another uh, 495 law enforcement positions that are eligible to retire in 2016. Corrections have another 111. Parole and probation have another 45. And telecommunications have another 66. So if you add those, what people can do next year, what the possibility is based on the current vacancies and we try to get these people through these classes, there's a realization that there's not enough classes available to move this type of education. So they're asking for funding for an additional 2.5 million to be able to cover that additional cost. Uh, I thought that's relevant because it was something that we're dealing with. So even though we might even be increasing our FTEs or trying to do something in the jail to be able to get that back on the training fees that we discussed, uh, it might be difficult to get into the education they need if we don't do lateral transfers or, or lateral hires and stuff like that. So, um, but I'm sure that's something the sheriff is working through and have a conversation with them on making helping the, the know what's happening that way. The sheriff's association is, I'm sure, we're feeling in and out also. One interesting piece, and I think it applies to us, I haven't had a chance to confirm it yet or not. So. Uh, House Bill 4093 basically is, um, will give the counties the ability to, uh, the commissioners of each county, if I get this correctly, the ability to vote to increase court filing fees and um, it, applies, and allows, it, it applies to us, but it's not going and allows the, the judge to uh, surcharge on uh, certain issues to be able to fund or pay for court facilities. So um, they had a, they had the hearings on it the, on Monday night, and I don't know. The, you must have word that it, it died. I and mean, Claudia was indicating that they had a, a few legs. I got an email that included multiple justice court judges from the chief justice that said this is a ridiculous proposal because basically what it does is what happened in Ferguson is we're gonna we're gonna charge people to pay for this stuff and not supportive of it at all. And I mean, if you, if you don't have the Chief Justice, right. and also the uh, I didn't get that TCA, uh, Trial Court Administrators Association, saying, bad idea, it's not going anywhere. It was kind of a county, it's struggling counties want to generate revenue. And this would be doing it basically by issuing tickets. And it's not good. Public policy. That's why I say I don't think it's going anywhere. I didn't get the word "is dying," but I thought it was something that we should have on our radar because of the impact it could have, um, or you know, could potentially have. Um, I mean, I would not. If it, it had passed, I would not recommend you guys put a surcharge on top of people's fines and fees to incent people to write tickets to. I don't disagree with that. But that's the kind of legislation that's coming out right now. This is just really interesting right? so, um, Is what does ASD stand? Like who sponsored that bill? Because um, I'm kind of shocked that even some of the sponsors were it. Or did it come out of committee? Because there is a justice court 
It came out of committee. I think that the, uh, the majority of the, some of those counties that need help. Or, um, or I think it was Claude. No, you know, it wasn't something that was on that we looked at. A, uh, it was Claudia that was basically briefing on it. It didn't get brought up by committee. So she was talking about it because the public hearing on it was that night. And she was looking for a testimony on it that night. But not too many people jumped right up to testify. For I you know, it was an interesting one to watch. So is was AOC supportive of it or not? It never got brought up in committee. Oh, okay. So they didn't. So the AOC it's didn't best, take a stand. It's best not to even bring it up formally in committee if you really if it's controversial like that. Oh, I thought you discussed it. At AOC. You're right. Public safety. She brought. Uh, it was brought up by an affiliation. Oh, just to present. The committee didn't bring it up. Oh. But during open discussion. One of the, we, we noticed affiliate associate uh, reports. So when those associates do a report to the committee, they can talk about what they're doing and what they're looking for support on, and then the committee can decide if they want to bring something forward or take a position on it. But isn't Claudia a lobbyist? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, public relations. Public relations. For Multnomah County, right? Yeah. So this wasn't even an affiliate report. No. Yeah. So it's kind of one of those, mm -hmm. that type of stuff's allowed in affiliates. The chair's discretion. So I, I felt it was important to. I just point that out because I wanted to make sure it wasn't the Justice Courts Association no, no, or the DA's Association. It was, no. it was put, being pushed by a very powerful county. So that's pushing, why. Pushing? Uh huh. Really? Yeah. So when that county starts pushing things, I've seen crazy stuff happen in the legislature, including brand new court facilities being built at the taxpayer's expense instead of the county of expense. That, that's the public, our ta court task force, the creation of our court facilities task force. Mm -hmm. so because of everybody's going, wait a minute, that's not right. Mm -hmm. um, tomorrow, uh, House Bill 404014 is going to start moving, and that's the uh, marijuana and hemp legislation. So. Pretty much AOC is coming out in neutral on the majority of it. It doesn't necessarily... Uh, uh, is this the bill that Rob just sent an email out about yesterday or today? This morning I got it. I didn't see this morning. What did he say? Well, he's asking for input. And I'm going to meet with Kelly after this meeting and talk to her about some issues she sees in it. I don't know if I'll be able to talk to you all and notice it by Tuesday if it's actually going to get a hearing today or... It's supposed to move tomorrow. So, so I don't know if I'll be able to... I'll come and talk to you individually about it because, I, you know... I didn't get the... Uh, maybe I don't. Okay. Well, I think he sent it to the primary people that are dealing with working the in each county right. to develop, you know, the ordinances and rules. I'll, I'll, I'll come and talk. Are you both going to be here? Yeah, I didn't, yeah. I didn't email either. I'll come and talk to you after. I, 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 I need to do some research first. Or else I will talk to you now. I don't sound like that. But we're, we're going to be asked for rights and input. So, or we have been asked for rights and input. So. Yeah. The, um, but right now, there's there's any neutral on that particular one. The ones that... Uh, they're recommending support on is to uh, clarifying the governor's ability to enter into compact with the tribe. Personal use, possession of recreational marijuana clarifies prohibition of mar marijuana items visible in public place. Clarifies prohibition of manufacturing or processing extracts. Uh, clarifies a prohibition on importing and exporting of marijuana items. Uh, moves the CSA special definitions to separate sections for clarity. On, on, on this compact, is it so that it would would allow the tribes to do marijuana? Yeah. Because did you guys see what happened in California, just right here? Mm -hmm. So one of the tribes built multiple huge greenhouse right. facilities, and they moved, or they contracted with non-tribal members to grow the marijuana and then redistribute it back to them for distribution. 
and the feds came in and took it all and took the warehouses and everything. Mm -hmm. Because it's uh, they're still subject to some of the federal fees and there's no state protection. They didn't they didn't enact their sovereignty. That's why I'm assuming this is happening. Yeah, yeah it's, the, it's basically giving the tribes the ability to do well. The feds regulate the tribal. Yeah. So it's going to be interesting if they have a, a, a compact with the state. I don't know how that's. I'm not only a lawyer. I don't know how that's going to work. But that's just one of the things in this particular bill. The other, uh, there's a bunch of adjusting of crime levels for unlawful manufacturing um, within a school, manufacturing in general, unlawful delivery, uh, another unlawful delivery within a thousand feet of school, um, possession for those uh, 21 and older. So it clarifies unlawful possession for people that are 21 years and older, so those who can use it. What's possession? What's lawful possession? What's not lawful possession? So it does some cleanup on that. Um, uh, minor possession of more than an adult can uh, can possess a misdemeanor, basically. Uh, and the prohibition there is support the uh, prohib uh, prohibition of the use of marijuana in vehicles on the highway mm -hmm. because uh, there wasn't anything on that before. <laughs> so there's some of the there's a lot of fixes that uh, are being put into place. Uh, but that's, like I said, it's supposed to be done tomorrow. And there's a whole lot that this association is saying neutral on, but portions of it that are uh, the regulatory pieces of their support. So instead of, oh, and overall, yes, we support this, we don't support this, we. we they're watching. They're watching <laughs> close. I got that in a lot of the. Yeah. Because there's parts of it that are good. And parts of it are bad. And if you can modify, if you come out and say we oppose this because I'm a bad piece, it could kill the bill and you lose the good stuff. But if it goes under committee and you can work it through your representatives and senators to get rid of the bad stuff and keep the good stuff or modify it to make it all good, it, it's, it's a win win. So that's why sometimes you don't see a, a positive position or a negative position in general. So we're going to keep an eye on this and we're going to tweak it as we go or do the best we can. Um, one of the things that also came out is proposed amendments to the Senate Bill 1511, that's the uh, expanded access bill. I think I brought this up once before. The expanded access bill is basically the piece that's going to start merging the, if you read it, it, it shows that it's basically a merger between medical and recreational marijuana. It's, just, it's the beginning of that merger. Um, and understanding how that uh, S. Senate Bill 1511 with the dash amendments, uh, I think it's the dash three already, uh, is important. Especially because as we work through our elements here right now, because they're, they're in the process of merging stuff. So as we might want to consider not only the character, but one of the deliberations. But, um, Understanding that as we go into that, I think it would be very relevant. Um, some of the DASH amendments that are, uh, that are out there right now, I'll just go over them quickly. Um, basically, it directs OLCC to register qualified OLCC licensed producers, possessors, wholesalers, and retailers uh, to produce, to possess, and sell medical marijuana. So that's the big one because now that gives them the ability to sell medical marijuana on a commercial basis out of the medical system. Not just on the, not just the nonprofit stuff that they've been running for a long time. So is that through the health authority? That's the OLCC. Well haven't they been allowed to provide access to recreational outlets already? They were given a temporary one year piece by the governor to allow that last year's crop essentially to be able to be sold to dispensaries. And we could have. Right. In our local jurisdictions, not a lot of it. Right. But there was only three or four months of it before it became regulation. What this does is it basically says the medical marijuana producers want to legitimize and they want to get out of just the medical field, but it lets them get rid of their excess because they've admitted in OLCC rack meetings of 50%, maybe more of their product is going into uh, different markets 
they wouldn't use the word illegal or black, mm -hmm. but they did in the hallways. But this is an attempt to basically curtail that illegal market and keep it all in the state and start uh, keeping things from being the problem in other states. Commercial, right? They'll, they'll be allowed to sell it commercially. Commercial. Yeah, which is a different piece than just a nonprofit status. So that's that's where it has an impact on us, especially in our zoning. Um, yeah, the second piece is a uh, direct old CC and OHJ to adopt rules to implement expanded access, uh, technical and conforming amendments. Marijuana retailers may not collect tax from medical card holders and clarify that local option sales tax does not apply to medical marijuana. Um, one of the pieces that the AOC is opposing in that particular piece of uh, 1511 is provides for medical marijuana card reciprocity with other states. Um, basically, if you have a card, it, it, it's, it, it's like a concealed weapons license. If that state has reciprocity with you, then it has reciprocity back and forth. What we're opposing here is, is reciprocity where uh, cardholders from California can basically have Oregon grow their, uh, their medicine for them and then ship it to California. Because California doesn't have any laws that allow for that. So it, it curtailed, we, wanna, we believe that that needs to be, if it's going to be reciprocity, it's full reciprocity to conform with the laws, not necessarily a one-way reciprocity. How? You know, the only reason why states have been able to do this is because they've kept it within the state and not violated the Commerce Clause. How is that not going to violate the Commerce Clause being a reciprocity? That's a great question. Line. And that's one that they have to figure out on the right the legal side. This is just a bill that's proposed, but that's something to be vetted out during the, uh, the hearings. They can't bring in federal law. That's kind of why we, we oppose that at all, reciprocity, state to state. It's, if we're dealing with it, we're dealing with it. The federal law applies. So, uh, so uh, the dash one expands early start retailers to dispensaries, uh, stays on medical grower plants, limits the old while low CC uh, producer license or uh, opt out on election pending, uh, stay on medical grower plants limits uh, to April of 2016, sunset for sections 24 and 25, so those stays, because that puts a sunset clause in place and said those stays are in effect until such and such date when they get repealed. Uh, <coughs> repeal the medical op grow opt-in to retail producers as unnecessary uh, unit uh, caption the emergency clauses. <coughs> uh, the dash twos are, and dash threes are a lot simpler. Removes pro uh, removes products containing uh, non psycho non psychoactive cannabinoids cannabinoids. For use on the skin, hair, from the definition of marijuana, industrial hemp, basically saying uh, excuse me, removes products containing. So basically saying you're not going to make products that have a psychotropic effect that are basically uh, shampoo or hand lotion. Because yeah. there's a there's that ability under some of this manufacturing to make hand lotion that gives a psychotropic effect. So it basically removes those products on the dash twos. On the dash threes, uh, exempts medical marijuana products from OHA concentration and packaging. Uh, they're recommending we're recommending an opposition on the dash three amendment because uh, the OHA is basically the ones that are in charge of saying you can only be packaged this much and this type of dosage. Uh, they're trying Somebody in this bill is trying to remove that from the OHA on medical marijuana, basically saying the doctor prescribed this much. But as this uh, 1511 starts merging recreation and med medical together, the standardized packaging and dosing is kind of a must. And so, you know, those are the Who's big testing it? Who's enforcing it? Those are the Oregon Health Authority and the OLCC. And it has to go to the labs. There's, there's a whole lab system that's being set up with this to do the enforcement and do the testing on the product. So they pull samples from so much in the batch and make sure it's good or meets the requirements. And then 
before it's even taken to market. So it doesn't meet certain standards that the product's not being <coughs> brought to market. So, uh, and I, it didn't get me who was doing the, uh, oh, Representative Olson was the, uh, on the dash two and dash three, and was, was the one looking for that. I don't know why you want to do that dash three, but I'll have to ask the question. The Department of, uh, moving out of the AOC stuff, uh, the Department of Corrections approached me. Can I, can I ask you something about AOC? Yeah. So you were up there on Monday or whatever, right. and you testified on some of this? I didn't testify. Oh, you didn't? No. I was asked to testify. And I, I sat there and I watched, but I wasn't going to testify on that. Oh, okay. I thought it was city. I was yeah. just wondering which ones you testified on. No, no, no. I, there was, I wanted to pay attention to all the happenings, but not necessarily. That, that was that. Uh, courthouse one mm -hmm. oh, yeah. no it's not going to touch that but it's somebody else's fault um, uh, Department of Corrections uh, approached me and basically said with the transition that we're having right now uh, or what's going on they were wondering if they'd like to do a, uh, if they'd like to do a peer review of our Department of uh, Corrections program. So, write something up, tell me what you're thinking, and get back to me, and I'll bring it to the appropriate channels. Yeah, I'm not interested in doing that right now, at the current time. I'm just, and yeah. I used to actually conduct the peer reviews for DOC, so I'm fairly familiar with the purpose of the meeting right now is not the time where we're going to do it. I'm just letting you know that it up. They approached me on that. I figured you'd want to know. Um, so I just said, write up what you're thinking and get it back to me. Who approached you on it? Here. Yeah. So. At NC? Yeah, NC is a, they come to the public safety meetings all the time. There's representatives from like, the governor's office. The so Jeremiah, I thought, was with the Criminal Justice Commission. He's the deputy director. Yeah, he, well, he was at one time. One of those yeah, he went here. So, so, I mean, they were, yeah, they made their beta. We're offering up their services to so come in and do a peer review and look at the program and what we have and where it's, where it is. But it's actually not DOC that does the peer review. It's actually other counties that we peer review. I'm saying that there's two programs. DOC uh, has one review that they do and make recommendations from the Department of Corrections, and then they have a second one where it's a much larger group that is a DOC group plus a uh, uh, corrections directors that are that are working with them. Mm -hmm. So I, I said write up what you got, and, and I'll. Uh, They'll send it to me next week or so, and then I'll bring it for you. Bring it back to me. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. We can discuss it further. I just want you to know that I was approached with that. Do they approach you personally, or do they offer it in a group? Personally. Oh. Right. Well, a lot of people are aware of what's going on in our profession. <coughs> that our staff go off just pay peer reviews. Right. So that's why I'm telling you it's two separate issues. Why well, I don't disagree. But um, I'm just trying to be careful how to say it. Is that it? That's all I have. It's uh, the fifth for the moment. Okay, so um, the AOC meetings I attended teleconference wise was the water policy. And um, I got knocked off the teleconference about five times. I kept calling up. <laughs> and uh, so I missed a lot, I'm sure. But um, they said the place-based planning was out for comment right now. And I don't know to when the, those uh, 
applications or grants that they gave, I'm not sure. I didn't get the details on that. And that the feasibility study grant funding was beginning. And they had other um, implementation grant programs that are listed as Senate Bill 839, and they were watching. Everything I heard about the legislative efforts and the water policy, they're watching. So nothing they took a position on. And then I tried to, I attended some of the legislative committee meeting um, and um, got knocked a couple, off a couple times and finally gave up on that one. But, so I don't have anything to report on that, but you were in that one as well, the legislative meeting. Yeah. yeah so nothing was. That's the frustration of those phone calls. I've never had that. I've always called in and never been disconnected before. Yeah. So they didn't know if it was their line or our line. And I just, kept, especially the water one, I just kept calling back. But I'll probably check with IT and see if there's something, if that happens again. That's the first time it's ever happened to me. They've been having some, they've been having issues with that for a while. And even the teleconference one, we had to work with them to try and get that back online because the teleconference part still isn't working because that was something we used to be able to do. Uh -huh. And it went away. But there's, there's oh, you know, it's a pain in the butt part and they're trying to figure out how to do that. It's really costly. Yeah. The other, only thing I went to was a couple of events with the City of Oak River. Um, the, they had a public workshop with the Metropolitan Planning Organization, and it was their transportation infrastructure, and it was a uh, public presentation on their plans. And most of it was involving the bike path connection that runs on to Grants Pass. And it, there was maybe five people there. I think when I went to the Gold Hill one, there was only two of us there, but so. But they were interested in what was going on. And then um, I attended the City of Rogue River Council meeting later that evening, and um, they didn't have anything alarming either. They, um, I don't have anything on that. <laughs> they went through their, the city, the city message, state of the city message, so. But it's always a great meeting to go to.